Okay, well, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, at this morning's coffee break. This is our mid-year uh, check-in on our results updates from our border wildlife study. And something that's been quite remarkable for us is when we gave the first report on this project back in July, it rained very heavily during the presentation. And I have to say that it's raining again it rained over the night here in Tucson. We've been getting some rain that's very much needed in the desert. So this feels like a really positive sign and it feels like even the climate is cheering for the wildlife <laughs> around us, which is really exciting. I wanna start by welcoming you to this conversation about wildlife at the US-Mexico border. This really exciting research project that we've been enjoying so much this year. I wanna thank all of you um, for your contributions to this project and to Sky Island Conservation. We really can't do any of this work without our volunteers, our supporters. So thank you so much for everything that you've done to make our work successful in 2020, a really challenging year. Next, I'd like to acknowledge that where we live and where we work is native land. And I would like to acknowledge that what I'll be talking about with you today um, is the ancestral land of many tribes that over, over generations have been living and understanding and stewarding this land. And I'd like to dedicate uh, our presentation today to the tribes of the Southwest. Okay, well, let's get right to it. Today is a celebration. Today is a huge party because we've hit a major project milestone, surpassing 100 wildlife species at the border. So um, you're on mute, but I'm sure you're all cheering and very excited like I am. <laughs> so let's just get this party started. Today, here are the things that I wanna talk with you about. Like I said, I wanna celebrate the wildlife at the border. With, in such a difficult year, I think um, if you're like us on staff and our volunteers, we are taking so much joy from getting to see which animals are thriving in the border region. And so let's really take this moment together this morning to celebrate these amazing animals. We're gonna explore this aspect of uh, biodiversity at the border. We're gonna be looking at the species richness of wildlife. Diversity has several components to it. One being species richness, which is actually the number of species that you find in a place. The other aspect has to do with abundance, how many individuals of each species you see. Our study that we're gonna talk about today focuses on the richness side, which species assemble together in this community. Um, and our methods are not able to adequately address the abundance side, though we are seeing some interesting patterns in how active different species are in this region. And we'll talk about that. We're gonna talk about who loves the oak woodlands. We're also gonna talk about who enjoys the night the most. And then we'll end with where we go from here with this project. Okay, so let's transport ourselves now down to the border region. And before we jump into the celebration of, of, of wildlife diversity in this area, I wanna set the context for why we're doing this project in the first place. Early, earlier this year, many environmental laws were waived along the US-Mexico border in Southeast Arizona and other places along the Southern border of the United States to facilitate and accelerate the pace of border wall construction. We were very concerned about the wildlife corridors um, south of Tucson and what would happen if border wall construction did completely close them off. So we felt there was a race against time to document the wildlife community in this place so that we could understand fundamentally which species are here. So we could set a baseline for what the wildlife community is prior to border wall construction, and then be able to use those data to guide conservation efforts to help manage these species during a massive period of change as the border wall is constructed. This year, the border wall construction began on the eastern side of our study zone. So I wanna, I wanna share this with you because we identified this place 
um, along the border as being higher elevation, more rugged, wild, open wildlife habitat in the Sky Island region. And what you're looking at here in the top is the western slopes of the Huachuca Mountain foothills, what the border road um, looked like with the border barrier that's been there for, for many, many years, going up the slope towards um, the Montezuma Pass, which is above Coronado Memorial. This is what it looked like in July when we got word that construction would be starting in the Huachuca Mountains, extending the existing border wall that was put in in the 1990s westward over the Huachuca Mountain foothills onto Coronado National Forest. Um, just within a month, they had begun to grade a road going up through, um, up onto this, this slope. And um, this is what it looks like now with much more carving into the Huachuca Mountains. So this is a context for what our study is designed. We really are trying to understand, first of all, prior to this construction and our, our study began in, the, in March, in the spring, what the wildlife community is prior to construction. Now we're in the period of the study where we are beginning to observe what happens to the wildlife community as construction marches across the study site. And next year will be very telling for us in terms of what happens with continued construction and we'll continue to document um, impacts on the, the wildlife community into next year. So I'm going to play a short video to give you a flavor of what it's like down on the border and how the study site and has been changing in recent months as this border wall construction has started. This field trip down to where we're conducting our border wildlife study was really different. We drove about 70 miles southeast of Tucson to where the Huachuca Mountains cross the U.S.-Mexico border. As we dropped down from the Montezuma Pass, we saw the expansive oak woodlands stretching as far as you can see into Mexico. And we also saw many signs that our wild public lands are changing as the wall is built. There are signs reminding construction crews to drink water and to keep the public out. And then these signs, the signs of all the contractors and traffic. There is new groundwater pumping to construct the wall and keep dust down as they build a mountain road up a steep cliff. Over there, this is Coronado Peak. So it's kind of right south of Coronado Peak. So, uh -huh. The face of the Huachuca Mountains are now dramatically changed as new border road zigzags up the steep Sky Island terrain. We visited a spring that usually provides water to wildlife year round, but today it was dry. Earlier this fall, a mountain lion and her three cubs visited the spring, just a stone's throw from the border construction. It's concerning how dry it is for the animals because it has been such an incredibly dry year. The wall construction and its associated water pumping just down slope couldn't be happening at a worse time when animals need this water more than ever. Every day of border wall construction, the noise displaces wildlife, permanently erodes our mountains and destroys habitat, drains water sources that will take years of rain to replenish and puts human border communities at risk from COVID. We will keep an eye on the wildlife and water sources here in this essential wildlife corridor between the U.S. and Mexico. This field <clears throat> Okay, so that gives a flavor of what we're experiencing now on the very eastern side of our border wildlife study area. Our project is set up along 34 miles of the border spanning the foothills of the Huachuca Mountains, here on the eastern on the eastern side through the Patagonia Mountains. And in the middle is the headwaters to the Santa Cruz River in the San Rafael Valley. And we have cameras distributed in a grid along this area. Most of our camera points are in the US, though we do have a set of cameras, thanks to our partners Naturalia, uh, on the Mexican side of this habitat at Los Fresnos. 
So we're using <clears throat> um, an international standard for wildlife monitoring called the Team Terrestrial Vertebrate Monitoring Protocol. And what this protocol does is it ensures that we are adequately able to document the wildlife community in a place by systematically distributing our cameras across the landscape. If any of you um, have practiced with wildlife cameras, played around with them, it's really fun to pick a place for your camera where you think you're gonna find the type of species that you're looking for. I certainly do that around my own house. I'm looking, I'm carefully choosing where I put it. What this protocol does is it prevents us from hand picking our locations. It systematically puts them across the landscape in a grid where each grid cell is one kilometer by one kilometer and our cameras are spaced out in every other cell. This means that sometimes uh, our cameras happen to be placed near a, a water hole, you know, a spring or a stock tank, if it happened to be in that place in the landscape, or it could be very far off the beaten path in the middle of a grassland with many features that we may not think attract wildlife. But it removes our bias about where we think wildlife are and allows us to often um, intercept smaller species, species that may gravitate away from water sources because they don't want to get eaten by predators. And it helps us have a much better um, a sampling of the landscape. This is what that translates to if you stand on the Montezuma Pass in the Huachuca Mountains looking westward. You can see this band and that's where our cameras are spaced. Um, they're spaced within a grid um, on, in this landscape. In the grassland, they're mounted on rebar where when we're in the Madrian evergreen oak woodland, we have our cameras mounted to the closest tree and they're often quite camouflaged. So what does it mean to start now recording <clears throat> uh, wildlife images 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Well, we have 58 camera points and in some places we have multiple cameras. And these cameras have been operational since uh, the beginning of March, March 9th is when the study officially started. In that time, we've captured more than 2 million photographs and I can tell you um, from, from talking with everyone <laughs> who's used these cameras over the years, one of the biggest frustration is getting false triggers when a camera um, trips because it senses vegetation moving as opposed to an animal moving through the field of view. So many of those millions were actually uh, not wildlife detections. But when they were filtered through, and thank you to our wildlife specialist, Megan Bethel, for doing an incredible job getting through 2 million photographs since March um, so that we can share these results with you today. And that filters down to 12,000 wildlife images. Now, sometimes an animal will walk by a camera and decide it's a pretty good place for a nap or it'll hang out and eat for a little bit. So not every single one of those wildlife images we would consider an independent detection. So we filter our wildlife images one step further and only count a species detection uh, if it's spaced 30 minutes apart from the last detection at that camera of the same species. So if you had a white-tailed deer come in front of the camera and it took seven pictures of it over a, sp a time span of 15 minutes, we would only count one of those as an actual detection. Once that filtering has been done, over the study period of the last just over six months, we had 6,300 independent wildlife detections. Okay, now we're just diving into the party part. We're gonna talk about all of the amazing things we've learned about these species. And so we're gonna begin with looking at who's been, uh, who's been active in front of our cameras, which species have we detected? And one of the ways that we look at this is just the rate at which we've detected new species over the course of the study. And a curve like this is called a species accumulation curve, but it's really just how quickly we, we have detected new species over time. So on the y-axis uh, is the number of species detected. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we've hit this 100 species milestone, which is really exciting for us. On the x-axis, we have the day of the study. So on day one, uh, very few species had been detected, but in the first days of the study, and this is very common in studies like this, many species are detected and you see a really rapid increase 
and who is showing up on the cameras. We did not know what the shape of this curve was going to be when we started the project. We'd had a couple separate cameras out in this region um, previously. One camera that is located on a water source, so that's a very uh, active place to detect species, had been out for a year and only reached the 25 species limit. So that tells us that there's really a lot of power in having a camera array like we have. Having the density of cameras spread across the landscape, across many habitats, has helped us detect so many more species. We're watching the cur this curve to understand when we've detected a majority of the species in our landscape. And that helps us have a pretty good sense that we have a baseline for the wildlife community prior to wall construction. So as you can see, once it got, we got past 100 days, the, the number of species slowed down in terms of how quickly we were detecting new ones, but it has continued to go up. And so we will be watching as the season shifts yet again into winter, and we analyze those data and get into spring again, what other species we detect. I think one of the things that's really important to recognize is we have detected already a majority of the species in this place, but it takes time to see the rare ones. So we're patient and we're gonna to continue to look with earnest every time we get a new batch of photographs in to see which new species are showing up. A couple of our favorites of the new, new set. I think when we talked about this in July, we were at 57 species. So we, we've jumped up by quite a bit. We were really thrilled to see the North American porcupine pop up. The first time, uh, the first photograph was from the rear of the animal and we thought, oh, that's gotta be a porcupine, but is it? But soon as we kept analyzing photos, we saw more. Um, Porcupines are fairly uncommon uh, in Arizona, but they can live in many different habitats. We're so excited to see this one. Um, it is, its main predator is the mountain lion. We have mountain lion in the region. So it's really interesting. It's gonna be interesting to see where we continue to see porcupine pop up. We've seen them now in multiple locations um, across the study. We have uh, the Mexican subspecies of the Virginia opossum. Um, we're also very excited to see this one. This is very uh, distinct from the opossum that we have in the Eastern United States. It's notable its coloration. So it has a much darker base to its tail, um, darker head and feet. And this is the very Northern end of its range. There's some, um, by, by coordinating with other groups that have detected the opossum in our region. We know that this is the Northern end range, but it seems like it might be pushing a little bit northwards. So we're really interested to see how many more detections we get and where else they're being um, observed in the region. This is the exact opposite of the porcupine where the porcupine is really, we're at the Southern end of its range um, along the border here. The Western Spotted Skunk. It's the smallest skunk of the four skunks we have in the region. It has a really beautiful coloration on its coat. And I think the most important thing I wanted to share about it is that our wildlife specialist deems this a very cute skunk and I concur. We have two migratory uh, bird species that are new. Um, the Broad-Billed Hummingbird that migrates up seasonally during the summer and also a blue grosbeak, which is really beautiful. Um, and this bird was fun. This, this bird was observed here in the San Rafael Valley. And this was the camera site that um, earlier in the summer burned and the grass burned in this area. It's been really fun for us to see all of the wildlife returning to this area where a grassland fire happened from a lightning strike. And then I just love this photograph of a juvenile great horned owl. Sometimes these animals, especially the birds, seem to really show off for the cameras. And we were really excited to see this one. We can tell that this one is a juvenile because it still has some of the downy feathers poking out around its face. Okay, please don't feel like you need to read the x-axis. <laughs> this is a list of the species that we've detected in the project so far. And the bars that are going up are letting us know the number of independent observations that we've had um, over the course of the study. 
So if an animal of a particular species was seen more often on our cameras, it has a much higher bar. Well, the big winner here definitely is the white-tailed deer. <laughs> here it is being pretty excited um, to be the number one uh, most common species that we've detected with 1,600 um, detections over the course of the study. But it by far has been so common that I'm gonna, we're gonna show you a graph now that takes uh, white-tailed deer out so we can see in more detail how often we're seeing other species. Okay, so this is the same curve. We've just cut off the bar for the white-tailed deer. And I just wanna share with you the variety of the other most common species, the top 10 species that we've been seeing on our cameras. The second most common is the Mexican jay. Number three are been deer mice. We've seen a lot of deer mice, especially for cameras, if it had um, a raised platform like a fallen log or something right in front of the camera. Number four, the desert cottontail. Love this photo of it leaping. Number five was coyote. Um, very common species across our study site um, in different types of habitat. Um, it was really exciting to see that. Um, followed closely by another canine, the gray fox. Javelina came in at number seven. And mule deer, number eight. The Cassin's kingbird was also incredibly common, um, which was exciting to see. And it's been fun to see the, the action shots of the, these birds in flight in front of our cameras. And then number 10, one of my personal favorites, the hooded skunk. Um, they have the most beautiful, dramatic tails, really furry, furry tails. So it's been fun to see them. Um, here's a set of additional species. If we just keep walking down that curve, so you can see the variety and differences between types of animals that we're seeing. So moving on from 10 to 11, we have the greater roadrunner, Black-tailed jackrabbit, butterflies like the pipe vine swallowtail, um, spiny lizards like this carp spiny lizard, American kestrel, northern mockingbird, northern harrier, wood rat species, then white-nosed coati. And then the last ones I'll share with you here, the ash-throated flycatcher has been quite abundant on our cameras, as have bobcat, and we love this photo of a rufous crowned sparrow. So we can look at them, of course, by individual species and look at how many, individ how many independent observations we have for species. But one of the things that's been interesting for us is to look at them in broader taxonomic groups, specifically splitting out how often we're detecting mammals, birds, invertebrates, and reptiles. Our study was designed to detect the mammals. So really that blue bar on the left with over 4,000 independent detections, that's what our study was to be, that, that's what our focus was from the beginning. The protocol is set up to detect these larger mammals um, across the landscape, but we can't ignore the other species that showed up on our cameras. And so it's been really exciting to see. We've had almost 2,000 um, independent detections of birds, like I showed you in some of the photographs, we've had some phenomenal insect observations, multiple species of butterflies, bees, and the reptiles have all been lizards so far. I'm gonna go ahead and now show you a different way of looking at these data. So not just which species and um, how frequently they're being detected, but patterns across the landscape. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, we're spanning 34 miles of the border and we have a pretty distinct change in the habitat and across this landscape as we move um, east to west from the Huachuca Mountains to the San Rafael Valley and then up into the Patagonia Mountains. So this just illustrates more specifically how we're thinking about our study zones. So on the western side, we have um, cameras distributed in the Patagonia Mountains within three kilometers of the border. Um, this is in Coronado National Memorial. In the San Rafael Valley, we have a block of cameras that are on state parkland. And this is a typical grassland habitat. 
we also have some Santa file cameras in Coronado National Memorial. And it's that ownership is sort of like a horseshoe um, spanning like this. So we go through some state park land here in the middle of our study zone, and then we get back into Coronado National Forest into the Huachuca Mountains. And here's where uh, Los Fresnos is. The whole reserve is highlighted, but our cameras are all within three kilometers of the border, south of the border. Okay, so we can look at how these different regions compare. And <clears throat> the Patagonia Mountains had the most number of species just by a little bit. Um, and that is, was really interesting for us. And I'll share some insight into why we think that might be. Um, it definitely had the most mammals, this blue bar here. And so that was really interesting for us to see that regionally this higher elevation um, Patagonia mountain habitat so was supporting a higher diversity species richness of mammals. Um, uh, conversely, here in the San Rafael Valley, which is a predominantly grassland habitat, we have more birds. And we're still trying to figure out why it is that the Huachuca Mountains have slightly uh, lower number of species occurring overall. Very similar level of mammals um, in the Huachuca Mountains compared to the San Rafael Valley, but it does have fewer birds. If we switch gears from thinking about the number of species in the last graph to this one, this is showing us how many independent observations of wildlife we had. So this is bulking together all the different taxonomic groups. So each bar represents a combination of mammals, birds, and vertebrates, and reptiles. And this just shows that not only do we have more species in the Patagonia Mountains, but we also had the most detections of, of wildlife. So it, it's tempting to say, oh, there's more animals there. It's possible that there are more animals in the Patagonia Mountains. It may also be that, our, that the animals that are there are more active in front of our cameras. So we do get more detections of them. But like I said at the beginning, our study isn't able to actually measure the abundance of species um, with this camera method. The San Rafael Valley had fewer independent observations overall, and the Huachucas was intermediate between the Patagonia mountain activity level and the San Rafael Valley. All right, well, I wanna spend a little time talking about the woodland creatures, the species that we find um, <clears throat> in our, our woodland habitat. And, and how that helps us understand why we're seeing potentially more species in the Patagonia Mountains and um, especially the mammals. So here is an image of what this Madrian evergreen oak woodland looks like. Um, it's, it's so beautiful. I'm from California. And when I first saw this area, it reminded me so much of where I grew up with the oak woodlands um, intermixed with, with grassland savanna. It's truly gorgeous. This is a view from the Patagonia Mountains looking across the border. Ugh, you probably can't see it. It's a really faint line. This is the border barrier um, that's there right now. And so what you're looking at at this mountain in the distance is in Mexico. And the Patagonia's transition into the San Antonio um, mountain range in Mexico. But they're very well connected. And this is nice high, higher elevation habitat that spans the border. So one of the things that we're looking at is how, what is the percent canopy cover difference for each of our camera sites and then rolled up together for each zone of our study. And so um, again, west to east is the x-axis from the Patagonia Mountains over to the Huachucas and the y-axis is the, the mean percent canopy cover. So the higher the bar in this case shows that there's more canopy cover spanning the area. It means more trees. Um, that means there's more uh, shelter potentially for animals, more cover. And it seems to be attracting a different um, set of species when you have higher canopy cover. Another way to look at this is just the number of mammal species that we're detecting um, across that range in canopy cover. So each dot that you're seeing uh, is a separate camera point in our study. And you can see that as canopy cover increases, once it's getting above 20% towards 30%, we're seeing a higher number of mammal species. More types of mammals are assembling together in that type of habitat. 
with more tree cover. So now we'll just look at some, some fun videos of wildlife that we've recorded enjoying this beautiful oak woodland. These are white tail deer. We've got three bucks. The one in the front, definitely in high alert. Okay, this is gonna be really cute, so prepare yourself. This is a stampede of a troop of white-nosed kawadi. The females raise their young together. And so what we were seeing were multiple um, mothers with their, young, with their young of the year running together through this little meadow area surrounded by oak woodland. And here's a fox, gray fox family. Okay, we're gonna switch gears and talk about nightlife a little bit. This bobcat's really excited about it. Definitely a party animal. Here goes a bobcat, sadly not wearing a party hat, but stalking through, through the night. This one's very quick. So before I press play, this is a Western spotted skunk hopping hopping along through a, a little ravine, which is really fun to watch. <laughs> Do it one more time. Okay, and then Havelina, also known as collared peccary. So this, um, this is letting us have insight into the activity times over a 24 hour period when we're detecting species and they're, it's very different. But one of the most interesting thing for us to see is how many of our detections were actually happening between sunset and sunrise. The y axis on this figure is the percent of nocturnal detections for each species. So animals that are listed and I walk through some of them so don't feel like you need to read the fine print. Um, Animals that are listed on this side have a majority, if not all of their detections in the study occurring at night. So they're very commonly being observed noc during nocturnal hours. And as uh, the graph moves this way, other species, then we get to the cohort of animals that are only observed during daylight hours between sunrise and sunset. So this is interesting insight into the wildlife community that we're monitoring. Um, it's very interesting to see which species are only occurring at night. These are ones that are more sensitive to perhaps potentially to heat. Um, maybe their prey sources are out during the night. And it means they're going to be sensitive to things like light pollution. And one of the concerns that we would have for animals living right around the immediate border area, if the wall that is constructed does come with lighting that could be disruptive to uh, these nocturnal animals. So let's focus strictly on the mammals here and you can see in a little bit more detail uh, which species were solely nighttime, oh, solely observed at night. Now um, we had 30 species total that were mammals and so far and 15 of them were only observed at night. And then their majority of the others were some at least partially active at night, which is really interesting. Um, and at least half of those that were seen both at night and during the day, they still were a majority at night. So the nighttime um, is a really important period of, of activity for these species. So just to highlight a few examples, ringtail hasn't been seen a lot on our cameras, but the observations we have are only at night. Mountain lion as well, only has been observed between sunset and sunrise. Uh, the American badger, real cutie patootie. I've seen it out at the day at my house, but at our study site only been out at night. So the skunk species, Western spotted skunk, cognos skunk, striped skunk, all of those animals have been seen only at night. 
raccoon only at night, the porcupine and the Virginia opossum. Oops, missing some videos, oh dear. Well, I was just gonna show you a couple of videos of the, of the animals, um, <clears throat> a couple of extra ones, but I think it's just really important for us to be aware of um, this nocturnal activity. And when we reflect on the study methods that we're using, this is why we're so lucky that the wildlife camera methods work so well. It allows us to passively um, observe these animals out at night. It would be pretty hard to be out there in person making observations across this entire landscape. And these cameras are really effective at in a least a disruptive way as possible, documenting the presence of these animals in front of our camera points. So we're so grateful that cameras are um, as logistically simple to use and have been very effective for us to be able to detect the species richness that we have. All right, well, what's next uh, with this project? And what our study is really, as I said in the beginning, is really to fully document the wildlife community. And to do that, we want to keep our cameras running. We want to make sure that we have the cameras operational to detect the more rare species that have not yet occurred and haven't wandered past our cameras yet. Of course, we're on the lookout for spotted cats like jaguar and ocelot, but there are other species, um, certainly bird species, smaller mammals that also haven't yet um, made a debut on the camera array. So we'll continue to define the wildlife community. We're going to be monitoring for change. We wanna understand seasonal changes with the animals that we're seeing. Our study cameras do represent an elevational gradient. And so we, we hope to be able to understand if certain species are shifting into higher elevation um, during parts of the year. And we'll be looking for that as we continue to analyze our data in the coming months. We'll also be looking um, at what happens with the wildlife community as wall construction continues. Um, the construction is approaching our easternmost camera as we speak. We do not know if there will be continued border wall construction across um, the San Rafael Valley. Um, we're, we're optimistic that there may be a change in political uh, pressure here to actually stop the wall, but in any event, we are going to be documenting what happens to this wildlife community. The construction hasn't stopped. It's not stopping yet. So we have a lot of work to do as a society if we want the construction to halt and to apply that political pressure. So our study will continue to keep watch um, during a very interesting year next year. And we want to be applying all of the data that we're collecting to border restoration efforts. There's certainly already been a tremendous amount of impact from construction activities. And we know that we'll be able to use this wildlife community data to help guide where restoration needs to happen first and give us a baseline for us to monitor the efficacy of that restoration uh, for years to come. So we're really excited about these data and our project isn't gonna stop well, as long as the, the border wall construction is still an issue for this region and while there are pressing uh, border restoration needs. I want to invite you um, to join this effort. Uh, we are always seeking volunteers to help us. We have started a new iNaturalist uh, project where we're putting up our trickiest observations. Um, so it's really the, the observations of wildlife species where we need a second opinion, second, third, fourth, fifth. We really invite you to lend your expertise and help us um, hone in on uh, which species we're seeing. These cameras, of course, um, don't always capture the best perspective of a species. We might see only a portion of a bird. And so we're really inviting folks that have an expertise maybe on um, a particular, even particular taxon or group of animals to help us understand if we have identified the species correctly um, and potentially to let us know if, if you can offer an alternative uh, species identification. Sometimes we only have our taxa down to the genus and we'd love to get down to species. So this is a great place for you to chime in and join an online naturalist community to help us get all of our research, observ our observations up to a research grade for publication. And I'd also just like to thank the 130 donors that are directly supporting our border wildlife study this year invite you if you're able to sponsor a border wildlife camera. 
Um, following this link at on Sky Island Alliance webpage, you can uh, make a donation to help keep this project going. Um, for as little as $19 a month, you can help sponsor a camera. And that's really, really helping us make sure that we can continue to tell the story of these wildlife species in the borderlands. just want to say thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sharing all of this news today, but I'm talking about the work of many others. Um, my dear colleagues, Zoe Fulham, who's been leading our field effort. Zoe, uh, Zoe has done an incredible job marching around to every one of our cameras on the US side and, and coordinating with volunteers. So a heartfelt um, thank you to Zoe. Megan Bethel here pictured with the pronghorn. She has, she's the one who has looked through 2 million photographs. So we know what our data says today, just six, seven months into the project because of her tremendous effort and attention to detail, finding even just hidden little bits of animals that are visible in these photographs. So thank you so much. Paolo Quadri has been instrumental in figuring out a data flow so that we can analyze and stay on top of what patterns are emerging from our wildlife data. So thank you, Paolo. Anna is new to our team and helping to tell the story of wildlife in the region through all of our communication channels. Brian has joined the organization again and will be um, in the field quite a bit maintaining our cameras. And this is our honorary staff member here, Britt. Uh, he's been instrumental in making sure that we don't ever miss a camera check and he's been a real um, important part of our team. So thank you, Britt. And so I just end with saying, um, Thank you so much for making this possible. We are so proud and excited by reaching this 100 species milestone. Thank you to our partners Naturali in Mexico for keeping the Mexican cameras rolling. Thank you to our volunteers and our funders. So thank you uh, for joining this morning and I'm happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. Emily? Yes. Okay, this is Dinah Beer. Um, I wondered if, hi, I wondered if your findings to date on spe species richness and diversity and location have been written up in a report yet that would be suitable for distribution? Um, we're in the process of that. We, we did update our website. So we do have um, results that I've shared with you this morning. Um, some of those up on our website. We are in the process of figuring out when we want to go to publication for this. I mean, I would love as the, the scientist in me wants to have at least a year's worth of data, but I also know it's really pressing to get these species list People out. And go through briefing the and at Homeland Security and the transition team for Homeland Security tomorrow, so. <laughs> So yes, the short answer is yes. I, I can we can share all of these data with an, an interpretation to you today if you want. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're not going to sit there and watch this whole thing. So I mean something that somebody could send a link to um, would be great. Yeah, I'll follow up with you afterwards, and I I do have some some a shorter document that has some high points describing great. key messages. That would be terrific. And one more question, if I may, and then I'll let others. Um, my understanding is the Coronado wall, the, the wall in the Coronado National Memorial is pretty much complete now. I don't think the lights are on yet, um, but the, the wall is there. And I wondered if your cameras had caught any reactions of wildlife to the wall and the locations where the wall is already up. Sure. Well, Coronado National Memorial is just over the Montezuma Ridge on the, so it's just outside of where our, our actual cameras are. Okay. Um, our cameras are on the western slopes of the Huachuca Mountains, so very close, and the wall is being extended over into this area. Um, where the data that we've been able to analyze to date is up through September, the beginning of October, and that's when a lot of heavy construction was actually happening. So we're right on the cusp of being able to see if there's an impact there in the next few weeks as we pour through the most recent photographs. I think we'll have more insight on that. We're working as fast as we can to analyze this in real time. Um, but like I said, it's, it's, it's thousands of photographs that we're going through. So it, it's a rush against time and we are exploring opportunities in the National Park Service to do more observations um, at Coronado Memorial. So we're working through that and we are trying to put out additional cameras. Great, thank you very much. Great project. 
Thanks, Diane. Are there any mitigation efforts regarding the lack of water down there that's been caused by the construction? Any Anything that can be done to help with that? Well, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of any active mitigation efforts at the moment. We think that that's a really important. We do think there are things that can be done. Um, it's a perfect storm of groundwater pumping for the wall combined with an incredibly dry year. So we're looking at a pretty extreme situation in terms of low water supply in the area. There are many techniques that have been shown in Sonora and in the Southwest that can be effective with helping with water infiltration to help catch as much of the water, get it to infiltrate back in and try to refeed our springs again in this area. So those type of erosion control projects would be excellent to do. And those are the things that we're going to be looking um, to collaborate with the land managers on um, in the months ahead so that we can really give wildlife the best chance they, they can, given um, the, the impact they've had this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily, um, thanks everybody for the, uh, your questions on the chat too. I want to just uh, read a couple so that everybody has a chance. Uh, Tara Oaks asks whether uh, uh, Sky Island Alliance allows volunteers to help with ID and counting species photographed remotely. For instance, I'm in Houston, Texas, and I would love to continue to support uh, Sky Island Alliance through this type of volunteering. Uh, SUNYverse works with voluntary citizen science to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a couple of ways to do that. If you are, are really detail oriented and want to look through raw photographs, you can contact us and we can um, set you up with a set of photographs to analyze if you don't mind sorting blanks. But mostly what we're um, asking people to do is go ahead and look at our photographs that we've already identified as and filtered as wildlife detections and helping us to offer a species ID confirm or deny the, the, the first um, identification that's been given. So that's possible through the Zooniverse platform and we have both a border wildlife birds project and separate mammal project there. And we're encouraging folks because it's so user friendly to join the iNaturalist community and go to that, that webpage um, to look at the species that have been a little bit trickier where we're getting some conflicting identifications. Mm. Thanks. Um, uh, there, Taylor Johnson, uh, did you imagine the process of taking the wall down would have more problematic impacts to wildlife than than um, than actually take you know taking it down? So would would uh, restoration? Leave, leave it up. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so would restoration be more damaging than yeah. um, construction? I don't see yeah. how that could be possible. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that we've been very uh, excited by is that once you reconnect habitats and nature can rewild relatively quickly. The damage that's been done from border wall construction and the associated infrastructure, some of it cannot be repaired. The damage that's been done to Native American lands, their sacred sites, um, those cultural features may be gone forever, which is absolutely tragic. From an ecological perspective, there's many things we can do to heal the land. And soon as a gap is opened up in an area that's been walled, animals can begin to move through once again. What mm -hmm. we need to be looking for is maintaining the largest open spaces without border infrastructure as possible. Um, there's a lot of talk of, well, would just small openings be enough for animals to cross? From what we've learned from an analogous wildlife crossing um, set of research in terms of when animals are willing to cross roads, either using wildlife overcrossings or go through culverts. Those are very scary and unusual for animals and it can often repel them. Sometimes animals really have to work up the courage. They have to be taught <laughs> to, um, to use those crossings. So I think oh, any openings is better than none, but we really need to be looking for maintaining these big, the biggest possible openings as possible mm -hmm. to let a majority of the species be able to naturally move through the landscape as they have for millennia. Hmm. Um, yeah. I'm Emily Matias. I'm a broadband leader with the Great Old Broads in the Phoenix area. Hello. Um, and we've got lots of volunteers who would be interested in this kind of thing. Uh, particularly, we're interested in if your research has shown um, specific areas in the wall that maybe if we are going to be able to take it down, what are some of these areas that would be the best to start with, at least for the for the wildlife corridors? Where does your research have information on some areas in specific, specifically where it's better to start doing that? 
Right. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, our research project is really this particular 34 mile stretch, which fortunately wall is only encroaching on the very eastern side of it. So our data okay. from this project can't answer your question. But okay. we are collaborating with many other groups that have wildlife cameras out that have been studying these corridors, been looking at important areas to reconnect commu human communities and, and protect them um, mm -hmm. by removing border wall infrastructure. I don't know, Dinah, do you want to jump in and say a little bit about more about that process? Yeah, there's there's a lot of work being done to identify criteria um, in the border coalition criteria for places um, that uh, should be prioritized in terms of removing wall, and then the effort will be to match those criteria to particular places. But you know, I would just say here in Arizona, obviously Quito Bakito uh, gets a lot of attention as being the only mm -hmm. um, permanent water in the in the Western Sonoran Desert in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then uh, obviously San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge in um, Guadalupe Canyon is going on right now. And okay. some of the areas in the Coronado. But um, yeah, there's a lot of work going on on that. Okay. I don't think it's going to happen right away. First, we have to stop Congress from grant from mm -hmm. appropriating almost $2 billion more in the next week for border mm -hmm. wall, and then get the contracts terminated before we get it down. <laughs> I know your, uh, your focus is on research. And as you said, Emily, it's this 34 mile area that this project's focused on, but, but maybe this is a question for Dinah. Um, what would be, I'm in Oregon, so I'm, you know, over a thousand miles away. Is there anything that's practical, pragmatic for someone like myself to do to try to mitigate what happens in this lame duck period you know, that we've read about accelerating construction in the Guadalupe Canyon and so forth? Um, well, um, as, as Dinah mentioned, one of the most important things that we can be doing at the moment is preventing more funding of the wall. Many of the law waivers are existing across the border. So if more funding comes, new contracts could get started, more wall, more miles of wall um, could be set for building. And it's a, like, as Dinah also said, it's a lot of work to terminate those contracts. So we want to move into a contract termination phase, but really reaching out to, um, to Congress now immediately um, is really one of the most important things that could be done as a first step. And then we'll be building on that. I think um, Dan Millis may have posted something in the chat about additional actions. Um, yes, he's put in he's put in a link uh, to an online action, so you can you can reach out and um, demand no more money for the wall. And I just want to say it's critical for members to hear from non-border states. There's plenty of us in Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas who are fighting this, but it it tends to be seen as a not in your backyard thing, along with many other things. And they, the members need to hear from their constituents in other states. So please get a hold of your senators and members of Congress. Literally, we have one week. The, uh, it has to be decided a week from today. And I suppose it would be a good idea to pass that link on to other uh, people that you know, you know, just spread it wide, far and wide. Yeah, yeah. Great. Were there other questions from the chat, Palu? Uh, I think you maybe you might have answered this uh, a little bit before, but um, Suzanne was asking us how do we plan on using these data to protect wildlife in this region, in this area? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we um, our goal here is to help get the word out about what species are living in this area, the incredible biodiversity that we're witnessing here, where border wall construction is at a very imminent threat. Um, and then we use these types of data as we design management plans for long-term conservation of species. Every species may be uniquely affected by the border wall construction and um, the impacts here in this region. So the first part of this step, just really understanding who's there and what's, and what's which species are present, this can be followed up with more detailed investigations about the abundance and the more specific distributions of species that seem to be most at risk and impacted by the wall. 
So we, um, this is really the first step, really fundamental data, um, but we hope it will be part of a longer term effort to better understand and manage for the long term survival of these species. Um, we're filling, we're stepping in and filling in a gap. Normally the type of environmental review and study is done prior to federal construction projects, but because of the law waivers, this research wasn't done prior to construction. So we're chasing the ball a little bit. We're stepping up as private groups and collaboratives to, to fill the data need to inform our science-based conservation practices. Yes, hi. Hello. Huh. I think we have an unmuted phone call. Oh, okay. It's so yeah. many faces. I can't tell where, the, yeah. <laughs> where voices are coming from. Um, I saw something about the presentation link. Um, when the Zoom ends, we'll be able yeah. to get the recording up. Um, we'll have it on YouTube and we post it on our website. We have a library of all of our coffee breaks and mm -hmm. we'll add it to our border wildlife study page as well. So hopefully that can be ready by the end of the day. Um, yeah, I don't think, oh, Paula Redinger, she was asking, am, am I correct that direct contacts are more effective than just signing petitions? Can someone repeat was this week deadline was, sorry, I can, I, I don't know, Paula, if you want to clarify your question or if someone. Yeah, the week deadline refers to Congress having <clears throat> to pass appropriations to keep the government funded. That was set to expire today at midnight because they couldn't make a decision. They extended it for one week. The border wall has been characterized as one of the major issues. And what the only figure that's in the bill right now is $1.96 um, uh, billion dollars for, for border wall construction. So um, right now it's either zero from the House or almost $2 billion from the Senate and um, that is disastrous. So we need no more border wall funding. And we need mitigation money. <clears throat> Seven, <clears throat> $75 million, which is a drop in the bucket, but um, there is $75 million in the House bill for mitigation. Um, we certainly need that passed, but no border wall funding. Thank you, Dida, and thank you for all you're doing to, to lead this effort. <laughs> And yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it, Emily. I don't know if um, anyone else has another question or comment, but we're all close to 10.30. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining. Um, please stay tuned for more information about this project and what's happening in the borderlands. And don't forget to join us next week for our coffee break. It's gonna be another parade of wildlife. We're gonna be looking at all of the best photos from our other wildlife project, Photo Fauna, and you will be able to vote live and pick the winners um, wildlife photos. So just be prepared for a lot of really cool wildlife photos next week. That'll be Thursday at 9.30 um, and a Zoom registration link. Uh, we can probably paste that in the chat before we end as well. So I hope to see you next week and please be in touch with us if you have more questions about the project or want to get involved. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your week. Enjoy the rain if you're getting rain. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, -bye all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.